All right. So Kelly is asking, I am hit by the fact that men sleep with marry more than one woman and no one looks down on it. Women who are brought up in scripture are stoned for such behavior. Help me understand. Thank you, Kelly, for asking. And I know this is something that many, many, many people struggle with, and it's used as a basis often for rejecting the Bible. And if it were true, I would say like, yeah, I mean, that totally makes sense. Like God, God's wrong, but the God isn't wrong. The way we are thinking the Bible is teaching us is actually wrong. And it's important to understand the difference between what God really wants, which is often referred to as God's perfect will, and then God putting up with people being sinful people out of his grace and mercy to give us a ch time to grow and improve. And, and so just because God might tolerate something and, and, and not immediately stamp it out doesn't mean God approves of it. And it's, it's that case with sin. That's why God has immediately stamped it out. He's going to. He has a plan, though, and he's out of his mercy, giving us a chance to do better and come into alignment with him. So what was God's initial plan? We see this beginning in Genesis 1, starting at verse 27. And it reads, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female he created them and i i believe that this verse is telling us that in fact it's male and female really that is when we reach the pinnacle of being in god's image it's not just man by himself it's male and female together in a close intimate relationship when they're effectively one that is that is the truth. Um, and so when we have here, so I'm sorry, I'm having like some tick issues. There we go. So when we are looking at it, as is male and female being an image of God together in close oneness. And in fact, it, it's not just oneness. It, there's a general sense of equality there too. Genesis 2, 18, it says, And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Now, a lot of people read it, and, and, and it's really, I think, unfortunate the way it's written in the KJV, where it says, I'll make him a help meet for him. And people think it's help meet. You know, like, here's a woman that's a piece of meat who's supposed to help them. <laughs> I mean, it's no, it's a helper meet who's fit who's perfectly comparable who's who's kind of equal to this guy Th that that's the idea and and how did god make her you know she took the rib out of, or god took the rib out of adam to create eve he could have taken any other bone the tailbone the toe bone whatever um the, the skull what he chose the rib kind of like you know you're you're on par with adam and in fact the rib is like protects the heart you're you're there to protect adam's heart that's a whole sermon in of itself uh, but it, it wasn't that there she's completely subservient to him and all that and and you're gonna say well but, but i thought man's ahead and, and yes again there, there's sort of this concept where man adam was a little bit the, the top just like the father i guess you could say sort of the top of uh, of jesus but it wasn't such a then the the father doesn't lord over jesus and adam wasn't to lord over and and dominate and suppress eve it's like okay yeah he's in the 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 role of of being the top so he has a bit more responsibility but his love is then to love and to glorify and lift up eve just like god the father loves and glorifies and lifts up jesus so that that was the relationship they were supposed to have. And again, it was supposed to be one man, one woman. Uh, that was God's plan. Not one man marrying multiple wives. God did not intend for that. Uh, then we come to Genesis. Uh, no, we can skip Genesis 2.20. We just sort of talked about that. But that's where we talked about the formation of Eve. Then we come to Genesis 3. 
Genesis 3, this one's so important. This is often used as the reason why women should be trampled upon, why they're second-class citizens and all this stuff. Genesis 3, 16, it says, To the woman he, God said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your, and your conception. In pain you shall bring forth children. You desire Your desire shall be to your husband, and he shall rule over you. Now, it wasn't exactly new here that, you know, Adam was the head of the household, but this concept of man, you know, the husband ruling over the wife and the, the wife, you know, having the, desi the desire for the husband and sort of yearning for him and doing just about anything to appease him. This was what was going to be the new thing. And God isn't cursing women, isn't saying, I'm going to bring you down. I'm going to punish you. It's more like God saying, this is going to be the natural consequence now of your sin. This is what's going to happen because now sin is in the picture. Now the relationship isn't going to be so equal. You're not, now you're not co-equals. Now you're going to have this tyranny almost of men coming into play. So it's really sad. It's really sad what has transpired. We are far from God's plan in Eden. And... It didn't take long for man now sort of being the head of the household, ruling over women to introduce things like mistreatment of women, infidelity, divorce, polygamy, all these things come into play. But if you think about it, it makes sense. If we were made in God's image to be one male and female, uh, not saying God is, you know, has male and female attributes, but I'm just saying like male and female, the two of us coming together as one, if that's in the image of God, Satan's going to do all he can to destroy that. And that's where, again, he brings in the mistreatment of women, the infidelity, divorce, polygamy. These are all aspects of attacking it. And it didn't take long for polygamy to come into existence. If we look in Genesis 4, Genesis 4, just four books into the Bible, we come to this descendant of Cain, who just a, a couple generations down from Cain. And it says, then Lamech took for himself two wives. The name of one was Adah, and the name of the second was Zillah. Then Lamech, jumping to verse 23, said to his wives, Adah and Zillah, hear my voice, wives of Lamech. Listen to my speech, for I have killed a man for wounding me, even a young man for hurting me. So look at this guy. He's a murderer. He is already not the upstanding citizen, and he's the first guy of record to have, to have two wives as well. And he's of the lineage of Cain. Like we can be clear here, the Bible's telling us this is not a good guy, not someone who's a model and example we should be following. But sadly, polygamy eventually does become a fairly common practice by time that I think when we get to Abraham's time, it's there. It's it's all around. Many people probably are are doing it and aren't thinking twice. I mean, look at when a Abraham is asked by Sarah to go sleep with their servant, he's like, okay, I will. And they, they, and I don't think Abraham, Abraham consciously was aware that he was violating even the, the, the rules of being faithful to your wife. And, and we see this now. And, and this is interesting though. Genesis 16, one to six, it says, now Sarai, Abraham's wife had borne him no children, and she had an Egyptian maidservant whose name was Hagar. So Sarai said to Abraham, See now, the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. Please go to my maid, go into my maid. I shall then obtain a children by her. And Abraham heeded the voice of Sarai. Now, verse 3. Then Sarai, Abraham's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, and gave her to her husband, Abram, to be his wife. Ever after Abraham had dealt, had dwelt, sorry, 10 years in the land of Canaan. So he went into Hagar and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress, Sarai's mistress, became despised in her eyes. Then Sarai, uh, sorry, I, I think you're saying Hagar began to despise Sarai. So then Sarai said to Abraham, my, my wrong be upon you. It's your fault, Abraham. I gave you my maid into your embrace. And when she saw that she had conceived, 
I became despised in her eyes. So Hagar hates me. Hagar thinks I'm better than her because, or she's better than me because she could give a child. So now it just totally destroys the family dynamics. Um, and Sarai goes on to say, the Lord judged between you and me, Abraham. So Abraham said to Sarai, indeed, your maid is in your hands. Do to her as you please. And when Sarai dealt harshly with her, she fled from her presence. So terrible family dynamics, actually horrible. And guess what? Every single time that we see a family like this, I mean, other than when Lamech was mentioned, I, I think we're, we're being told of how the family is struggling. So you could flash forward and look at Samuel's parents. Uh, Samuel's mom was unable to have children and she was being picked on and she felt like second class citizen. Her life was miserable. She's always crying because the other wife's always reminding her of how you have no kids. And so God doesn't like you. And horrible hurt and broke the the heart of the husband who had multiple wives then and look at uh, actually we could go back to even genesis look at leah and rachel the wives of jacob jacob really wanted rachel but he was tricked into also marrying leah and leah was always then the second class wife and so she tried to become the favorite wife of bearing children and then you get into this children bearing contest between Rachel and Leah. And at the end of the day, poor Leah just never was given the love and never had the meaningful marriage that she desired. So it's really sad. Uh, and, and, and the Bible tells these things again, because it's not that God is approving of them. God is showing us real life stories and the pain and heartache that the, the sin brings to warn us against it, to show us, what it's like so that we don't feel like we should we have to go through that experience ourselves we can avoid it because we have written record of what these things lead to uh and and in fact there there's even some some people believe that in leviticus 18 18 it says um nor shall you take a woman as a rival to her sister to uncover her nakedness while the other is alive uh, some people believe this verse is in fact um could be worded such that it's not just limited to a sister, but just saying like, while your wife is still alive, you should not take another woman also as your wife. So if that's true, then we even have God still reinforcing and commanding even to the, the Israelites, don't have multiple wives. And in, and in Deuteronomy 17, verses 14 to 17, we also have, the warning about having, when you have a king, don't let your king have multiple wives. And what's the reason why? It says, neither shall you multiply wives for himself, lest his heart turn away. So, you know, king, if you're going to have multiple wives, it's going to be a problem because they're going to turn your heart away, turn your heart away from God. And did we see this happen? Absolutely. First Kings 11, verse 4, we go to Solomon. It says, Solomon grew old. His wives turned his heart after other gods. There we go. And his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God as the heart of David his father had been. And so here again, proof, multiple wives could be at the heart of, of even affecting one's spiritual life. And David, gosh, Solomon's father, he had multiple wives. Look at all the problems it had. It led to with like one of David's sons and ending up sleeping with one of David's daughters with another wife, and then the other sons and murdering that son, and then that's yeah, another son then tried to take over David's kingdom. It was just his family was an absolute mess, and a lot of it is attributable to his multiple wives and and even the infidelity with Bathsheba. So, and finally, in the New Testament, again, there's more reinforcement of having just one wife. God, Jesus, in Matthew 19, goes and quotes the Old Testament, the, especially the part about male and female, husband and wife shall be, the two shall be one flesh. Um, some scholars point out that Jesus here is sort of thumbing his nose at the Pharisees who believed in being able to have multiple wives. And Jesus specifically went to this verse and in a translation where it emphasized that they are just these two should be one flesh. Mm -hmm. And then 1 Timothy 3, 2, for example, there, there's multiple verses with Paul emphasizing one, one wife. 
It says a bishop must be blameless, blameless, the husband of one wife. If, if we go to 1 Timothy 3, chapter 2, it says, let deacons be the husbands of one wife. Uh, I mean, just again and again. So the, the whole Bible is telling us again and again, God's plan always was, it still is, one man, one woman together experiencing the oneness uh, of marriage, being an image of God like that. That is a, it's such a beautiful thing. That's when you have uh, happy, healthy marriages. And, and in fact, that's what marriage is all about. Malachi 2.15, it says, But did he not make them one, having a remnant of the Spirit? And why one? He seeks godly offspring. Therefore, take heed to your spirit, and let none deal treacherously with the wife of his youth. It's such a beautiful verse. That's really God's plan, raising up godly women, uh, I'm sorry, godly children in an environment where there's just a male and a female, a husband and a wife in, in the most intimate relationship uh, of, of true love. Now, I see we have a question from our friend Robert. Robert says, uh, maybe you could read the question, Wendy. So Robert is asking, um, do you think it, do you want the, the next, next one, question? The next one? Do you think it's feasible for a man to love more than one woman in polygamy? I don't agree with it, by the way. Yeah, so I, I hope we answer that. And the answer is no. I, I there's never has it really been, I think, proven that a person can ever divide their love to um to multiple spouses. It just never works. And that's a, a clear thing we get from the Bible. Uh, Tina, any thoughts, anything to add? Yeah, I think that was really good um, as far as, you know, I, I definitely agree. You know, the, the when we see these stories in the Bible that are like, you know, polygamy and, you know, even people who are God's people participating in it, it's not there to say, oh, God approves of it. No, it's here to say, these are the problems it causes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not part of God's plan. And I think that was really great. Um what you shared there. And I just want to point out something that um, our friend uh, Kelly said in her question, because it, it made me think you um, Kelly, you said, I'm hit by the fact that men sleep with and marry more than one woman and no one looks down on it. But the thing is God looks down on it. And so yeah, I know the thing is like, I know it's very easy to, um, to think like, well, it's just accepted. So, I mean, this must, you know, Christians do it or people who call themselves Christians or whatever do it. So it must be okay. And the thing is, it's not. And God is very clear in the book of Hebrews chapter 13, verse four. I just want to share this verse. It says marriage is honorable and all and the bed undefiled. So marriage, the way Jesus said, like Jay pointed out, um, we see it also in Mark chapter 10, you know, that a man shall leave his parents to cling to his wife. He didn't say wives, wife, <laughs> one. <laughs> and it says, you know, that, you know, the two shall be one flesh. Um, and so, but again, Hebrews chapter 13, verse four says, marriage is honorable in, in all and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers, men who sleep with around and do whatever, or women too, God will judge. So this is a very clear verse. God does not approve of, you know, men or women who, either or sleeping around doing whatever they feel like. That's not in harmony with God's will. God will bring judgment to those people. And so, um, you know, even if, you know, things might be accepted in culture or whatever, that doesn't matter. Um, God doesn't care about the culture. God cares about, you know, what is right and what's not right. Mm -hmm. And so God will bring, you know, true justice into those situations um, when he comes in his glory. So, you know, just, yeah. it can be frustrating the world we live in. I hear you, sister, trust me. <laughs> it is ridiculous and, sometimes, and I, but, but I'm, I'm just okay. grateful that God is the great judge and he judges righteously. So yeah, sorry. But Amen. Absolutely. I, I just wanted to add to the other piece of her question, which was, you know, the women were stoned for this. Well, the men are basically, after, that's a cultural thing oh. that more that, that, that was not, Jesus didn't throw stones, right? Like he's not the person, he, God is not the one saying to stone these women. And that was cultural. And it's important to understand the woman that was going to be stoned, it wasn't because she had multiple husbands. It was because she was caught in the act of adultery. You know, she was sleeping around with multiple people who weren't her husband. Um, I try to see if there's anything in particular about a woman having multiple husbands at all in the Bible, but it, it doesn't seem to be there. I think it just wouldn't cross their mind in male dominated society that there would be multiple husbands to one wife. Um, so that's not an issue there. 
Um, so yeah, it, adultery was a big thing. And, and, and you have to understand in their eyes, like Abraham sleeping with Hagar wasn't adultery. He kind of sort of, you know, married her almost in a sense. And, and this is why Hagar was becoming really proud. She was thinking like, I've been elevated to wife status now. And, and again, like David, Solomon, they don't think they're being, uh, disloyal to their wives they don't think that they're breaking they're, they're committing adultery because i'm married to these people and i'm being faithful to all my wives i'm not sleeping with people who aren't my wives other than their consorts um but <laughs> uh but yeah it, it, it's just their perspective is, is very different and again we're not excusing it like what tina says like what god said what god thinks about it is what really matters and god didn't improve of it. it technically those were sins that they were doing, but as Tina said, you know, when in our times of ignorance, God winks, mm -hmm. and and God realized they they were doing the best they knew, and and there were bigger sins, bigger things for them to be worried about, and and God's not going to, He will forgive us. Yeah, but and also just to sorry, follow up on a point that Wendy brought up as far as you know, um, women being stoned. You know, like in the story of the the woman who was, you know, caught in the act of adultery, like you mentioned in John chapter eight, you know, Jesus um, shows the character of God here too. And then, you know, that the men were trying to accuse her because they were really trying to, you know, attack Jesus. Um, and Jesus just starts writing out down their sins in the dirt. And he's just like, what are you guys doing? You're accusing her, but like, really? Like, and, you know, eventually it gets down to just Jesus and this woman. And do you see Jesus stoning her? No, he gives the most beautiful words ever. Um, and he's, and, you know, he asked her, does anyone condemn you in verse 10 in John chapter eight, verse 10, he goes, where are your accusers? Do it. Does anybody condemn you? And she says, no, Lord. And Jesus says, neither do I condemn you go and sin no more. So mm -hmm. here we see the beautiful character of God, which is that, mm -hmm. you know, we all have sinned and all have come short of the glory of God, but God, it, Jesus isn't there to condemn this woman or any woman or any person. He's there to, you know, show them his love and then show them a way of a better life of, you know, leaving a life of sin. And so um, I just hope and pray that you see a glimpse of God's love and his true character, you know, not that you see in the world, but that you see in the Bible, which is God's word to you and his love letter to you. So Amen. I just want to share that with you, Kelly. Mm -hmm.